Hello and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. My name's Emma Doyle, and I'm interviewing Rachel Carew today on the Coaching Podcast. She's the CEO of Stepping Into More, and I'm so excited. That's her book. She's a producer of CD of Songs. And to be honest, the thing I love most that I can't wait to talk about is that she actually helps people find their inner GPS in order to unearth and honour their true north. Welcome, Rachel, to the Coaching Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we'll jump straight into it. The first question, Rachel, is the Vegemite question. You either love it or you strongly dislike it or you've never tried it. Have you been to Australia? What, you had two questions there. What's, what's your take? So I have yet to go to Australia. It's definitely on my bucket list. And I've also yet to try the Vegemite. So I wanted to answer the other question saying, <laughs> yes, I love it. But I have to be honest, I haven't tried it. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, in that case, because you answered that way, you can choose. Actually, I'd probably love one story of each. But if I may, your best coaching moment and what were the lessons and a coaching moment that didn't go so well and what were your lessons? What, what, what would you like to start with first? Why not start with the positive? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Singing to my philosophy already. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so I had a client a few years back with Facebook, and she was a leader there. And on just sort of a by the way, in our one of our first sessions, she had shared with me that she has a passion around uh, being a chef. And and then she like kind of let it go. She was like, whatever. And I, I brought her back there and really started to talk to her more about her passion and what was getting in the way. And by the end of our coaching, she actually had asked Facebook to take a leave to, um, she had enrolled at a top notch pastry chef school in San Francisco and they let her take the leave. They guaranteed her position coming back and she ultimately did come back to Facebook. She decided, you know what, after trying it out, I, she still was finding ways to incorporate it in her life, but she ultimately decided that she, she wanted to stay in the corporate world as well. Uh, so that was definitely a wonderful experience to get to witness that. You know, I love that story because so many times I've heard stories where somebody's just quit their job and they've gone on to something else and all of a sudden it hasn't worked out and they've got nothing to fall back on. So I love the fact that a company, that, that companies can provide that, that safety net to be able to go and seek out your passions. That's awesome. What about on the flip side? What have you got for us? Yeah, you know, this was a tough one for me because I also facilitate workshops. And for me, that's way more obvious, like when I've had a bad experience. <laughs> In the coaching arena, though, um, I years ago, I wound up coaching a couple separately. So and, and I don't normally do couples work. So this was definitely out of my comfort zone. And I was coaching them each individually on different arenas, really around their businesses, primarily. And then I later learned that um, while I was coaching them, because this went on for a few years, first of all, the husband, he was having real issues of accountability and follow through. And I think he suffered with ADD. And at some point, I've never done this before or ever since. I asked him because he was not following through on his commitments. What is the one organization that you absolutely despise? And I, I can't recall, it might have been the KKK, something horrendous. And I was like, okay, if you don't follow through with this next commitment you make to yourself, you're donating money to that cause. <laughs> like it was that severe. And then later on, I learned that apparently he had a sex addiction and, and he was cheating on his wife for with quite a few, he had a polyamorous life that she knew nothing about. And yeah, it was really a shock to learn all of that. So, so much learning for me in that situation. 
I thank you for sharing that story. I don't think we've had quite a story like it on the podcast, but I it takes me also back to, it reminded me of when I was in the sports coaching world and so many times coaches use physical activity as a punishment. So if you don't do this and you have to run a suicide and it really creates this lots of things that are not useful, but especially helping kids really hate physical activity, which is such a shame. <laughs> so in my girl power camps, I always say, right, if we pick up the balls in under 60 seconds, I'm going to reward you with a one court suicide. And they, they look at me at first, like I'm crazy, but there is a method, method to the madness, but that negative connotation, I, it's so important that we don't link contingencies, isn't it? That's, that's a great story. All right. The next one, Rachel, is the sliding doors question. Yeah, two come to mind. Um, one, as you mentioned in the beginning while introducing me, one of my first passions has always been around creative self-expression through singing primarily. And um, I, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is a pretty prestigious school when I was 18. And I didn't get into their second year program. And I didn't realize at the time that I was a full-fledged perfectionist. And I just thought, I must suck at this. And I literally turned my back on performing for over 20 years, even when I was the human resources manager at EMI Music Distribution with 10 record labels, no one had a clue that I sang. And one day as I was driving to Long Beach to facilitate a work-life balance workshop and my life was not so balanced, I was in a car accident and thankfully it wasn't too serious, but while in physical therapy, I saw a flyer for a workshop called Joy of Singing. And that workshop really changed my life to reclaim that creative spirit that I have and to start performing a bit. And also ultimately to writing my autobiographical self-help book, stepping into more lessons from a recovering perfectionist, which is a lifelong journey, as well as producing the CD of songs. So that was a definitely unexpected experience that led to much growth and learning for me. Mm. Oh, it's so important to tap into all sides of us, isn't it? When we suppress one, it ends up coming out of whether it be resourcefully or unresourcefully in, in, in one way or another. So thank you for sharing. All right. Our holy grail question of coaching is in one to a maximum of three words. What do you think makes a great coach? Oh, okay. Uh, curiosity, safe container. Okay. Am I allowed to say any more? Is you, that it? You don't, is, now, the, I could hyphenate that. I'll give you one more quality if you want. It's up to you. And definitely I want an, an expansion on each one. Yes. The other is seek versus share. Go, take it away. You're allowed now to, to expand on those. What, what do they mean to you? So curiosity, there's multiple levels of curiosity. One is around, of course, curiosity for the client. Another is curiosity about myself and noticing how I show up or where I might be triggered during a session, how I'm coming into play here. And the third level of curiosity is around the agenda for the session. And when I allow myself to really be curious and follow where the client wants to go, we might have initial framework of where we think we're gonna go, but it often leads to a much richer session when I really follow that intuition by staying curious and open. Kim Miles last week on the coaching podcast, Accessing Intuition, she spoke so much about exactly what you just said there around the agenda and letting go of the agenda. But when you're a beginning coach, it's great to have the agenda, isn't it? And then leaning into your uh, int your curious intuition is awesome. All right, uh, safe container. Tell me yeah, more. So one of the things I really, actually I think that led me to coaching was even just as a, a kid, people just always felt very comfortable opening up to me. I'm naturally empathetic. 
I um, really I like to be a trusted advisor for people. And so I, I very quickly am blessed to be able to create that space for folks to feel comfortable, to feel open. I'm also a fan of being vulnerable myself through sharing my story and my learnings without, of course, taking over that there's a fine line there. Uh, but being vulnerable in that way shows that I'm authentic and therefore it invites them to be authentic with me as well. So that's what I mean by safe container. I may revisit that one and ask you your little tips and tricks <laughs> around how you do that. Uh, all right. And seek versus share. Yeah, so I think there's, uh, and this is such a great leadership spill too. I actually like to call it seek before you speak. I think many of us tend to do a lot of speaking and the, the art, I think, of knowing how to ask effective open-ended questions. And then the hard part is truly listening without your own agenda. And then either A, the person comes up with an amazing idea that I hadn't even considered, or B, maybe I wanna piggyback on part of what they shared, or C, if, if I don't think that idea is necessarily going to, to be effective to really avoid saying, no, that won't work, uh, because people won't play again if, you, if, they, if I do that. So how do I perhaps ask even more questions? Oh, what would that look like? What do you think the impact would be? How would so-and-so respond? So that hopefully that person will come to their own realization as to, oh, that's probably not gonna work. Um, so, because the more that people own their stuff and they get to be empowered to make choices for themselves, the greater accountability, the more creativity. Um, so it's just, it's a win-win for everybody. So that fine balancing of seeking and speaking, uh, I think is really key in coaching and also just as a leader in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Seek before you speak. Very catchy. I can't, out there. Claim, I can't claim it. I, I learned it many years ago. <laughs> but they're the little gold nuggets. It's paid forward. Yeah. I think even these days, it's hard to come up with an original little quote. Very hard. <laughs> so it's all about sharing is caring, I, I believe. All right. The last question, the official last question is, what sparks your curiosity? Um, what sparks my curiosity uh, really about what, energizes people, what brings them to life, uh, because that often leads to very rich conversation, whether it be around values, strengths, what gets in the way of people honoring who they are and what's most important to them. So I, I really enjoy that energy when you see people just like, ah, oh, this is the thing, you know, that I just really love. Mm. Um, it's such a sacred space to be able to have those types of deep conversations with people. Mm, fantastic. Well, now we get to go rogue. So I'm just going to stay on that topic, if I may. <laughs> I, I really have been thinking a lot about energy. Uh, I call it an energy signature. You know, was the minute someone walks in the door, we can feel their energy. And I think there's been so much talk about COVID fatigue and burnout and et cetera. So what are you seeing as the biggest problems as it relates to energy and what maybe might be one or two coaching tools that you utilize with your clients to help with uh, people's energy? Great question. Yeah, so actually, um, I'm certified as a strength-based coach, and the tool that I use is called Standout. And my number two, what they call Standout role, is what's called a stimulator. And that's somebody who's very attuned with energy, <laughs> which I definitely am. And that also means that my energy is pretty obvious to people. When I'm on, I'm on. And when I'm off, oh, you'll know it. So... <laughs> I have to really work at, okay, how do I stay at a more neutral space when I'm triggered? And, and that's actually a lot of the work I've been doing recently with people, especially um, with COVID, is first of all, just to give them space to be honest about where their energy is at and, and how they're feeling. And secondly, I've been um, actually learning a, a model called positive intelligence, 
which really looks at our saboteurs on the one hand, and on the other hand, our sage self. And the way you know whether you are being gripped by a saboteur versus your sage is the energy. You, the messaging you might be giving yourself, may, for example, if you're a hyperachiever, um, and by the way, all these saboteurs are strengths overdone. So great to be achieving a lot. If though you're telling yourself, you're guilting yourself, you're shooting yourself, you're judging yourself to get it done, you're in the saboteur mode versus you could be taking the same actions, but coming from a place of empathy, compassion, curiosity, and getting terrific results without all that residue. <laughs> so really supporting my, this is something I'm learning and loving and also supporting my clients is really knowing, okay, what is that distinction when I am gripped by my saboteur? And then the interesting part from a neuroscience perspective is instead of going down the rabbit hole thinking more about the saboteur, because it's lying. When your saboteur is up, it's lying to you. So you don't want to feed the beast by thinking more about it. Instead, it's like a pattern interrupt. Stop. Now, mindfulness exercises, very short, like whether it's rubbing your fingers or breathing or what do you see or hear is a different way to start building muscle of your sage self, which is more located in your prefrontal cortex, our thinking part of our brain, to start building new muscle. So it all starts though with that awareness about the energy, which then leads to more awareness about what is our thoughts and our thoughts lead to the feelings, which lead to actions and choice points. Mm. Well, I hope everyone's taking as many notes as I am. <laughs> uh, yeah i'm really enjoying this model a lot personally and and with my clients <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm definitely going to investigate this further and i think really at the end of the day if i was to summarize what i heard would be self-awareness <clears throat> to be able to then pattern interrupt which i love pattern interrupt and i think with the winter olympics being on right now the amount of patterning and imagery and mental rehearsal that they go through is more obvious. And yes, maybe it's more life and death. Some, some of the, uh, some of the events than perhaps the summer Olympics, but the importance of what they go through in their mind to be able to have the thoughts and then the feelings that they need to be able to be, you know, they can't be 1% off. It has to all, all come together. And I think I'm a big believer in anyone can access these types of things. What are your thoughts on that? I love that example. And, and just to piggyback on that, that visualization piece, I mean, I think they even did research with Olympic athletes before where they had some visualize um, certain activities and others that did not and others that just did the activity. And the ones that visualized were the most successful. So to your point, yes, we do have that ability. And that's actually part of the training is anticipating, oh, can I see myself either in a future situation where I might get triggered? How might I be able to engage more of that sage self ahead of time. And similarly, looking at past situations that didn't go so well and revisiting it as using more of what, um, he, the, uh, what they call um, PQ reps, positive intelligent reps, which are those mindfulness activities to help you get to a, more of a, a neutral place before responding. So either looking at the past or anticipating the future the more that we keep engaging in those mindfulness exercises to build the muscle it helps us in the moment to be able to deal with things while they're happening, which of course is the most challenging when we're triggered, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. When we go back into our childhood self and everything goes, as you said, down the, down the rabbit hole, usually in an unresourceful way. Um, just picking up on what you said there about this, uh, a lot of people call it toxic positivity, or I've certainly... I know that plenty of people have said to me, Emma, you're just positive and it's not realistic all the time. And how do you do that, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to just pick up on one thing you said, because even with the, the PQR, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I heard is that it is about being in the moment. So bringing yourself back to the moment to then be able to put the reps in of your desired outcome. 
versus this uh, overflow of, of toxic positive energy, just be positive or just think positive. And as we know, that is one that triggers people <laughs> when you say that to them. So let's say, let's go role play. If you had a client in front of you that uh, was their boss at work is just telling them, just think positive, just be positive. And they're feeling overwhelmed with all this. I'm sick of people saying, just be positive. Where would you go as a coach with that information? And what are some of the tools you might use to help that person? First of all, I would create safe space for them to truly emote, like, tell me what you're feeling, like, go for it. <laughs> like, just, here, I'm not your boss. Tell me exactly what you feel. Uh, and then I would greatly empathize with them. And when we empathize, that forces people then to start using their prefrontal cortex because if I start to label, oh, it sounds like you're really frustrated because of dot, 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 it forces them now to think. They can't be in the amygdala. They have to think. And, and I might, they might be going, no, that's not it at all. I'm not frustrated. Great. Keep going. Tell me. So I'll keep listening until they're like, yes, that's it. And then when they're at that more neutral space, now they're at a choice point. Now we can take a look more logically at, hey, what if anything might you want to shift? What if anything, um, how might you might be per perhaps adding in the mix here? Uh, if you, there was no fear, what would you ask for? What do you need? I'm a big fear, uh, fear. <laughs> I'm a big fan of asking for what we want and need without being tied to an expectation. So perhaps there's some room to communicate with your manager and to be able not to blame, but to really own what is it that's not quite landing for you. And instead of making assumptions about where your manager's coming from, really getting curious and asking like, I don't know what your intention is. Here's the impact though, when we have these types of interactions and I really wanna be able to work effectively with you. So here's what would work better for me. Um, so something to that effect, but for giving them permission to really feel, I think it's so important. And then Emma, there's that fine line. It's like, you know, if you put your hand on the hot stove, it's important that you feel pain so that you know to remove your hand, but how long are you going to keep your hand on the stove? And I think, you know, that's where that balance comes in because now we're ruled by the saboteur. If we're ruminating and we keep going back and forth, now it, I'm just hurting myself. That it's not serving me to stay there. Mm. And when you were talking about the saboteur earlier, I heard that word should. Ooh, oh, yeah. Or deserve. Ooh. <laughs> Two things for all of us coaches out there to really pick up on that sort of language in our in our clients and our and our athletes. So I said I, I wanted to revisit, as you sort of mentioned, the, the safe container. Um, yeah, what are some of the ways uh, that you help people? You said you shared that you're, you're vulnerable and that helps them be more authentic. Is Do you have like a practical tool that comes to mind that you help allow that self uh, safe container space? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's not something that I really think too logically about because it comes naturally for me. So I'm considering, how do I do that? Um, and I think part of it is just being myself really, and, and just not putting a lot of pressure on myself. And, you know, a lot of newer coaches might like have all kinds of pressure and stress around the session where Thankfully, after many years of doing this, I know that if I really show up as me and I am curious and I am empathetic and I'm willing and open about myself, I think those are sort of the three pillars that help to really create that space where people know that I'm not pushing some agenda. I'm not pretending that toxic positivity, like, no, I'll, like, I'll let you know if I've had a challenging experience. Um, even just telling my story around not singing for 20 years. I mean, that was a very painful experience. And, you know, and I, and I own that. So 
I think the combination of those three things really does sort of set the stage for people to, to realize that they can be honest and open and that there's a safe space for them. And I guess the, only, the other thing that comes to mind is humor. Um, you know, I like to laugh. I like to get them to laugh. I like to, you know, we're not like joking lightly about their issues, but sometimes we got to laugh at ourselves too, right? And, and laugh at circumstances to, to help us, you know, take life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And in helping people find their true north GPS, and, and also one of the reasons I got you on the podcast is because uh, so I'll come back to that question, but was uh, I attended your workshop on resilience and self-awareness around resilience. And I really loved the practical activities that you used and allowed us to really think a little bit more deeply and simple things like writing our name with our opposite hand. And then we had to switch the pen into the other hand and, and just talk about what we felt. So I really loved that. So could you share with us maybe sort of a, as we round this this podcast, maybe your top three tips for helping people find their true north? Ooh, well, true. Well, first of all, the resilience. I created an assessment. If anyone's interested, go on my website. You'll find it, Self Resilience Indicator. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. And with the GPS, so the idea here is that what is our true north? Our true north is identifying what are our natural gifts, what are our passions, and where do we enjoy being in service to others. And when I first started doing purpose work, it was a little daunting to me because being a recovering perfectionist, I felt like I have to have my one true purpose. And I, and I didn't. And I was like, how am I going to do this work with people? And then as I continued to read and learn, I realized that there is no one true purpose for very few people. And, and so when we're able to identify our natural talents or gifts, where we get energized and passionate, our strengths, and where we like to be in service, and when we can find an activity that combines all three, now we're leading a purposeful life. And I don't need to be concerned about saying, this is my purpose. It's just, wow, now I'm energized, going back to energy. Now I'm feeling alive. Now I know I'm contributing back into the world. And I am on purpose. Well, that's three things right there that I'm sure every single person listening to this episode can easily write down about themselves and help their clients unpack that because there's no doubt our decision-making aligns when, when those three things uh, align, don't they? Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Love it. And that there is, okay, one more, one more question. Uh, it is around perfectionism because many of our listeners are sports coaches and, you know, there's an element of perfecting a technique and, there is also that element then of competing because it's in, in my TEDx talk, I have a, a line that says uh, it's often not the person with the prettier technique who wins the game, but the person with the stronger character, mm. even though I did my TEDx, but I've got my wearing my TEDx t-shirt today, actually. Um, but even though I did that in 2017 as, you know, one of those talks that you have to memorize so that that was a reminder of that comment within my talk. Uh, so as a recovering perfectionist yourself, what, what's a tip out there for coaches dealing with perfectionist clients? I like to view perfectionism as a mask. And when we're gripped with perfectionism, basically we're telling ourselves that if I could look and act perfect, that no one's going to really know either the fear or insecurity or judgment that I'm holding against myself. And it's really a facade uh, because the truth is when we put that mask on, first of all, we disconnect from ourselves because we're not being authentic. And secondly, we disconnect from others because people don't resonate. They're, they're looking at you going, how can I ever be like her? She's so perfect. And they also might start to really get like, that's too good to be true. Like that, you know, this can't be real. So we disconnect from ourselves and others. 
So I think really for coaches, it's getting clients to really start to own the messaging that they're giving themselves. Again, thoughts lead to feelings, lead to choice points. And if we can get clients to start to truly own what are those subconscious negative messages that we're giving ourselves because the majority of our thoughts are subconscious and negative, then we can bring it up to a conscious level and really then start to ask, like, is that truly serving you? Mm. Is that how you want to show up? And very much my coaching is around being a recovering perfectionist. On the one hand, I'm very action oriented and I could check a million things off my list. But at the end of the day, if I'm miserable, then who cares? Mm. So the same is true with my coaching with my clients. We're focused not only on the actions, but who do you want to be? How are you showing up internally and being very intentional around that? And over time, it really does start to change the definition of success of any interaction. It's not just about a business outcome. It's also because we can't often control whether or not that outcome is going to come that way. We could try to influence it, but we can only control ourselves. So if I am also being very intentional about those one or two qualities that I want to focus in on in any interaction, that's a new definition of success because I know that I was in integrity with myself. Mm. Well, You've heard it right here on the coaching podcast. Who do you need to become to get to where you want to go with curiosity, energy, and so many other things? Uh, Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you on the podcast. I've got a page and a half of notes. I hope everybody else does too. And I just uh, really appreciate you. So thank you for being on the show. Oh, thank you. It was such a, a great conversation and um, a delight to, to be able to share so much. Thanks for listening, everybody. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes, a global coaching, mentoring, and U.S. college sporting scholarship placement service. The service helps athletes navigate the often challenging world of choosing your best college fit while maximizing sports performance. Visit www.transitioncoachforathletes.com. That's the number four. If you or your company are interested in sponsoring the coaching podcast, reach out to info at emmadoyle.com.au. The coaching podcast is brought to you by your energy and high performance under pressure coach, Emma Doyle. Emma potentiates individuals and organizational teams by harnessing their energy, discovering their purpose, and achieving high performance under pressure through adopting a curious, championed mindset and proven coaching tools that unleash human potential. You can learn more about Emma's service suite by visiting www.emmadoyle.com.au or email her, info at emmadoyle.com.au. Emma is originally from Melbourne, Australia, now living in stunning Denver, Colorado. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating review on your podcast listening device. And don't forget to tell a fellow coach about the show. The ball is in your court to take action and enjoy your coaching.